Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa New Zealand, episode 16. I need to add you a question. Hans is supported by you, the listener, and since the launch of the Patreon two weeks ago, we've had some very generous people become patrons. To Karen, thank you for the tip, I'm not brave enough to try and pronounce your last name, Papa Bray, Taylor May and Mum, Alexander, Paul and my very own dad, Tenakoto. Thank you. It means a lot that you would donate money to help with the upkeep and improvement of the podcast, and that you think this project is something worthwhile. If you would like to join these wonderful people in helping the show out for even just a dollar a month, you can search for the history of Aotearoa New Zealand on Patreon. Last time, we talked about how the materials were obtained and then used to make toki, the ads, which was, and still is, one of the key tools in the Māori Carvers kit. Today, we're going to continue on that line and talk more about adzes and how they were used, as well as some other tools used by pre-European Māori Carvers, with some still in use in the modern era. At the end of the last episode, we talked about the different types of ads handles and how those were used for different tasks. When making a carving though, the first step was, of course, to find a tree and cut it down. After you did the rites and rituals to ask Tane Mahuta, god of the forest, for one of his children, there were a few different methods of bringing down a tree. One way was to simply cut the roots and push the tree over, where it would be left to dry for a month or two. Easy, simple, straightforward. Well, in a manner of speaking, it was still a lot of hard work. Trees like Totara have a much deeper root system, and as such, some more inventive methods were used. One way was to use fire, by making two deep adz cuts, one above the other about a metre apart. The material between the cuts would be adzed out, and a small fire lit in the new gap, which would burn through the tree and fell it. Easy peasy. The problem with this method, and the reason it wasn't terribly popular, was that most trees were wet due to New Zealand's wet weather, and since the trees were still alive, they were green inside, which anyone who knows anything about lighting fires will tell you doesn't burn very well. More popular methods were to use some sort of device, such as by throwing a stone tied to a rope over the lowest branch of a tree, and tying both ends to a large piece of wood with a chisel-like stone on the end. The gigantic chisel would then be pulled back and swung into the tree, kinda like a battering ram on a castle door. It's hard to describe what this thing actually looked like, as it's such a strange device, so I'll put an image up on the website that shows how it worked. This ram cutting would be done on one side until about halfway through the tree, and then repeated on the other side until the tree was felled. Again, this was a very labour intensive process. Although perhaps easier than cutting up all the roots with an adz, it still required a decent amount of upper body strength to swing the ram. The more adventurous or inventive Māori lumberjack might have used something that resembled a crossbow or small ballista. You heard me right, a ballista may have been used by Tuhoi and Tarawa iwi and perhaps others to fell trees. Granted the quote unquote arrow didn't have a pointed tip, it was a chisel blade, so it would have worked in a similar manner to the ram, except you would have a rope tied to a bent piece of wood at each end, with the chisel bolt on the other side of the tree to pull back and release. I'll post a picture of this one on the website too, cause it's even harder to describe, and it really is an amazing piece of technology. If it existed. I say that, cause it is disputed if this was a real thing used by Māori. We do have early explorers of New Zealand recording this device, but the fact that Māori didn't develop any projectile weapons like a bow and arrow, let alone the much more complex crossbow, leads some to doubt its existence. Which I personally think makes sense, given I would assume if this device was used to fell trees, someone would think, hey, this would make a great weapon to kill the hapu over the hill. Especially in a society that was on a heavy martial footing, and you would assume was always trying to get an edge over their neighbours. Which is the exact thing that will happen during the New Zealand musket wars. Right, so now your tree is on the ground, 
it's nice and dried out, the branches have been removed, and you're ready to start doing something with it. You can't just go cracking into making a waka or your best depiction of Grandad though. You had to go through three processes. Ranga was first. The scoring where the timber would be chipped across the grain at intervals to help with later adzing of the wood. Ranga means to lift, as the timber was lifted up and had another piece of wood placed underneath to hold the timber at an angle, making the stage just a bit easier to handle. Next was opatu, shaping the timber into its rough form, much like chipping and sanding the adz blade into its rough preform, followed by tamaku, which would make the wood nice and smooth. Once you had done these three steps, which would take some time and effort, you were now ready to hack away and make the best depiction of your granddad. Just make sure he doesn't think it's a tanifar instead. So that was some of what you'd be doing with our regular ads. But as we have talked about before, there were other toki that were much more highly decorated and renowned, making them objects of desire, status, and mana. These were called toki patangata, ceremonial adzes, and were typically held by a riki or rangatera, and maybe certain tohunga as well, for use in various rituals. These toki were naturally considered tapu, along with the tasks they performed, such as putting the finishing touches on other tapu items, such as wakatoa, war canoes, taking the first cut on a tree to be felled, and it's even possible that they were used to execute prisoners of high rank. Naturally, with items of great importance and rarity, toki patangata were handed down to the next generation upon death. Well, not quite. You see, the handle was buried with the previous owner and only the blade was passed down to the new one. I assume this was for a couple of different reasons, such as the fact that wood doesn't last long compared to stone, as well as it being much easier to carve a new handle from wood than it was to mine and shape stone, and potentially for the new owner to really have the ads reflect his personality and whakapapa with a new carving on the handle. Although, that is pure speculation. What I would say to back up the second point is that the blades of these adzes were typically made from one type of rock. Toki patangata were usually made with ponamu, which we already know came from one place, to Waipunamu, the South Island, which we additionally know was sparsely populated, with the majority of the Māori population being in the North Island and trade routes were shrinking due to increased warfare. As well as this, Punamu was hard to obtain due to the Alps, rivers, lakes and other natural formations making the South Island difficult to traverse. Along with all the difficulties of actually getting Punamu out of the ground and making it small enough to be workable that we talked about last week. Despite this, some coastal populations still made their entire living off mining, working and trading Punamu. In any case, what I'm getting at is that it was really hard to get a hold of Panamu Greenstone, and as such, make blades for these adzes, as opposed to just getting Widamu, the local carver, to make a new handle with a new design. The blades of these toki could actually be very old and have been passed down through many generations. Some have notches on the side, which could be to indicate the past owners of the adz and thereby increasing the mana conferred to the owner. We aren't sure if that is the case though, the notches could be to just help hold the bindings better as we sometimes see them in regular toki, rather than toki patangata. As we have previously discussed though, some of these adzes would have come from Hawaii to Aotearoa via the Great Fleet, even being used to calm the rough seas by quote unquote cutting the waves and breaking them up. Adding to their ceremonial nature is that the blades could be very large, potentially between 30 and 40 centimetres making them rather impractical to wield in the regular duties of a normal adz. Like many tapu items and taonga in Māori culture, the handles were carved, usually with some sort of guardian or ancestor, which would make the toki unique to the wielder as well as the hapu and iwi. This allowed for a lot of variation in style and motifs of the figure. For example, lizards were typically ensigns of the goddess of death and symbolised death evil and all that good stuff. 
So to symbolize bravery or strength, the figure on the handle of a toki patangata may be shown with a lizard coming out of their mouth, as if they were eating it. The end of the handle would also be typically carved with a koreke, a small carved head. I'll chuck some images up on the website as well, so you can see what some of these may have looked like, as they were really intricate and detailed. The binding on a toki patangata was typically the same as a standard adz, but once the three essential parts had come together, the blade, the handle, and the bindings, the pora would be added. This was the decorative piece that you also often see on taiaha. It was usually made of feathers, such as from the kaka, and here from the kuri, the Pacific dog that Māori brought with them, which would sometimes be plaited into the feathers as well. I've heard a couple of different reasons as to why this was done beyond pure aesthetic reasons. In Taiaha, it is supposedly there to distract the enemy as you swing the weapon around, and in both the Taiaha and Toki Patangata, it is allegedly used to absorb the blood to stop it running down the handle and making the item wet and slippery. I say allegedly, as I am very unsure as to the validity of these. If you are a trained warrior, you shouldn't really be distracted by some fur and feathers on a weapon. It's more likely you're concerned with the hearty end. And I can't imagine some tufts of fur and feathers are terribly effective at absorbing the amount of blood you are probably going to come into contact with if you're in a battle or executing prisoners. That's just my view though, and I may be wrong. Feel free to let me know. To add to all that, there was one other thing these ceremonial adzes had. A hole was often bored through the base of the handle and a cord put through to make a wrist hold. Think like a wee moat. This would help keep the adzes in the wielder's hand as they used it, presumably to save them any embarrassment of accidentally throwing a priceless heirloom. We also see these hand cords in Patu as well. Now, let's move away from adzes a bit and talk about some of the other tools Māori were, and still are, using for regular, everyday carving. The adz, of course, is a bit unwieldy if you want to put in those finer details, so small chisels were used to really get into the nitty gritty of a piece after an adz had done the heavy work. Today, we have all sorts of different types of chisels of varying shapes and sizes, most of which come from Europe and supplanted their Māori counterparts due to their superior materials and increased variation, leading to a wider range of techniques. Before Europeans came to our shores though, there was really only one type of chisel, with little variation. Most were just flat blades, although there were some that had an angle on them, like an adz, and even some that were double-ended, like Darth Maul's lightsaber. Some chisels were made out of bone, from seals, kuri, and of course various birds, such as albatross, which were particularly sought after for tamoko chisels. Kyore bones, and sometimes teeth for drill bits, moa, and even human bones were sometimes used as well. Due to this little variation, some creative techniques were used to get the desired effect. For example, the lack of scoop chisels meant that to put a nice hole into a carving, the carver would dig the hole right through the wood and then adds off the back which is a trick still used by carvers today. In saying that there was little variation and that European chisels were of a superior quality is being slightly disingenuous though. The people wielding them were often highly skilled and in trained hands, these tools could create works of art easily comparable to works made with modern tools, even if they were a bit more rough around the edges due to limitations. The blades would often sit in a little step on the wood handle bound up with flax cord to keep it together, again, similar to an adz. A neat little thing is how carvers would carry chisels around. They would either put them behind their ears or hold them in tatua pupera, belts made of fibre used to hold tools like chisels, sharpening stones and other small handheld items. Another traditional Māori tool in the box, or I guess tatua pupera, was the cord drill, or tūri, porotiti, or pirori, which mean drill, to revolve slash spin, and to twirl around, respectively. These were used to create holes in stone, bone, and shells, as opposed to wood. Most of the holes we see in Fukairo Rako, wood carving, are square, indicating the use of a chisel. So it seems drills 
weren't a popular choice for the medium. If you have ever watched the YouTube channel Primitive Technology, you may be somewhat familiar with the cord drill, but if you haven't seen it, then I'll put a link up under this video on the website along with some other pictures of them and how they work as well. If you're one of those people that can't look things up because you're driving, or just can't be bothered, don't worry, I'm one of those too, then I'll do my best to describe it. They would be made up of a wooden shaft about 30 to 60 centimeters long, with the bottom cut to fit a small pointed stone, which would be lashed on. The type of stone and the shape of it would depend on what was going to be drilled, as well as what was on hand. Two stones could be tied to the shaft about halfway up to balance the drill, as well as add weight to give some momentum when spun. There were some variations on this, such as using a heavy piece of wood or a circular spoked flywheel, which looked really nifty. Once you had all that, a cord would then be twisted from the top around the shaft, which could be pulled to twist the drill and make a hole. The spinning would also cause the cord to wind back up again, allowing them to be pulled and continue drilling. So if a drill wasn't used on wood, what was it used for? As we have mentioned, patu and toki patangata had holes in them for their hand cords, but they were also used in the making of fish hooks and heitiki. For fish hooks, a large piece of bone, after being sanded down, would have a series of holes drilled into it in a circle. This would leave a piece in the centre that could be easily tapped out, leaving a large hole with some jagged edges, which would then be sanded down as well. One section of the bone would be filed out to leave the classic U-shaped hook that is associated with many Polynesian cultures. One end of this U would be notched to tie the line to, and the other would be further filed down to be able to hook into any fish. We've talked a bit about heitiki before, how they were perhaps symbols of fertility as they were often depicting women and were worn by women around the neck, but their method of creation is interesting. Drills were used to make the eyes, which have a very distinctive round shape, but they wouldn't use the pointed drill like most other mediums required. Instead, the drill bit would be replaced with a hollow cylindrical piece of wood or bone, which would then be used to drill into the heitiki to form a round groove. But it wouldn't go all the way through, only so far as to define the eyes of the piece. What was important about this process though, was that the heitiki were, and are, typically made from ponamu. Traditionally, they were sometimes made from the blades of toki, trying to recycle a stone that was hard to get and maybe had worn out its life as a working object. Again, I'll put up some images on the website of both this process with the heitiki and of the fishing hooks to give you a better idea. Some other tools used were waru, scrapers, which were small stones with sharp or even serrated edges used to scrape meat, tendons and fat off bones, as well as skin animals. These were often made of obsidian, and were mostly found in the South Island due to their much heavier reliance on meat as a food source, compared to Māori in the North Island who could also rely on kumara and other plants. Which is interesting given that the South Island doesn't have any active volcanoes that were needed to make obsidian. There were of course the hammer stones we keep mentioning, that were used to do all sorts of things, from making adzes to mining other rocks. These could weigh between 70 grams or several kgs, depending on the job it was intended for, but usually they were used to pick pieces off a rock to make it into the desired shape. They could also be mounted and lashed onto sticks to make for easier wielding if needed. In a similar vein were mallets, used to hit chisels to get them to actually, well, chisel. Usually made of wood, they were a bit different to European round hammers designed for chisels, because they were square. And you'll still actually find modern carvers using square hammers over round ones when making for kairo rako. I think that's enough tools for now. We should really crack into some more of what Māori were carving, as opposed to how or what they were carving with. So, next time. We will cover the mythical origins of Hokkaido Rako, as well as the major styles of carving in Aotearoa and the Tokotoko. If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chinwag, you can reach me through email at historyaotearoa at gmail.com, or Twitter at historyaotearoa, or Facebook 
at History Aotearoa New Zealand Podcast. Aotearoa spelled A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. We are also on Patreon.com if you'd like to support us with cold hard cash. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes or your preferred podcast platform and to tell your friends to help us grow and teach more people about the history of our island nation. As always, haritu atu, hokitu mai, see you next time. <laughs>